if you have to make an insane amount of money, ah, then I agree, entrepreneurship is the only thing. As you get closer to your graduation, don't act from a point of fear. To be an entrepreneur, you need to be finished. If you knew too many things, you will probably miss. Imagine you're going to a CFO yeah. and telling the CFO that in the next month, 25% of his staff needs to be. And you better convince him to. Greetings everyone, in this edition of Exploring Minds, we have with us someone who is a real combination of strategic uh, intellect and people skills. Mr. Alok Goyal, who was the first non-MBA employee at McKinsey, who later went on to found one of the OG venture capital firm called Stellaris. Stellaris sounds like a new galaxy, sir. So let's dive in the galaxy of your thoughts and thanks a lot for doing this with us, sir. Don, thank you so much for inviting me here. For me, it's been a fabulous day. Reminds me of my times back in undergrad myself. So, thank you for making me part of this. Undergrad se thoda sa pehle chalte hain sir DPS ke time pe. Arey chaliye piche se bhi. ठीक है. तो DPS में जब आप थे तब वो modern school बारह खंबा versus DPS की वो थोड़ा सा चलता था. मैं actually थोड़ा सा fraud dip side था. अच्छा. I was amongst that mass of people who ha, would be until ten somewhere else. Hmm. And 11th May, we would come to the factory. Okay. So that's how I came into DPS. So when I came, I was, as I was not really original DeepSight in that sense. So I either was aware of those rivalries or, or uh, I was, I was not, not really into thick of the DPS gang, if you will. The yeah. sense. I came with a purpose, ki boss, IT hmm. and that was my only goal. So in some sense, DPS was probably a serious part of my uh, life where I was not really engaging as much on things that didn't matter to getting into IT. Here at least. Lasers are focused and then you create the IT. You choose computer science at that time. So, was the decision conscious that computer science is going to take it? Or then you got a computer science and you got a computer science. You know, it's funny you ask that question. Hmm. I did, by the way, choose computer science deliberately in 11th. That was a conscious call. And I had a choice for bio and computer science. Thi. मैंने एक जगह ब्लड टेस्ट करने की कोशिश की मैंने पहले बायो में एडमिशन दिया और थर्ड डे और मे बी सेकेंड डे दे आस्क यू टू डू अ ब्लड टेस्ट एंड दे डिवाइड इन टू ग्रुप्स ऑफ थ्री स्टूडेंट्स हाँ और वो एक आपको छोटा सा पेन देते हैं आप उसको एंड आई एम किडिंग यू नॉट दैट आई डिड क्लिक दैट पेन अबाउट ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फाइव टाइम्स एट एवरी टाइम आई क्लिक द बटन माई ओन हैंड विल गो अप एवरी सिंगल टाइम विल आई कंट मेक द प्रिंट एंड आई वॉज फ्रस्ट्रेटेड दैट I came back, told my dad, कि मैं जब ब्लड टेस्ट नहीं कर पा रहा ना ये मेरे बस का है सो सो दैट हैपन एटलीस्ट एट दैट पॉइंट इन आई टी दो दे वर डिफरेंट स्कूल ऑफ थाट उस समय आई टी कानपुर यूज टू बी वेरी हॉट एंड देर टू स्कूल ऑफ थाट वन दैट सेट दैट ओ यू शूड डू इलेक्ट्रिकल इंजीनियरिंग बिकॉज वेन यू डू इलेक्ट्रिकल यू लर्न कंप्यूटर साइंस एनी इट्स अ ब्रॉडर फील्ड एंड सम सेट डॉन कंप्यूटर साइंस इज द फ्यूचर एंड I remember we talked to so many people. My parents talked to so many people. This that, and in the end, there was no logic to it. Hmm. One day I came home, and I said, "I'm taking IT as a computer science period." I mean, that's and and that's it. So then, what is the fondest memory of IIT Delhi that you have? Because you were telling behind the camera that. मुझे सिर्फ कॉलेज का याद है कॉलेज में मस्ती करी थी एंड बाय द एंड ऑफ द सेशन यू वर टेलिंग दीज आर द गोल्डन पीरियड ऑफ लाइफ टेल अस व्हाट यू डिड इन योर गोल्डन पीरियड ऑफ लाइफ ओह वेल फर्स्ट आई कंफेस आई स्टडी दिस ठीक है आई आई नो वी डोंट लाइक टू कंफेस दैट फ्रॉम आवर अंडरग्रेड डेज आई ट्रूली एंजॉयड कंप्यूटर साइंस एंड आई वुड स्टिल से दैट पुट माय हैंड ऑन माय हार्ट द वन सब्जेक्ट आई लव द मोस्ट आई थिंक इज सब ठीक है um but outside of that uh, i think i used to be a very regular get up early sleep early that kind of a person it match all that went for a toss at one time ha raat ko 2 baje sona subah 12 baje uth ke seedhe lunch table pe pahunchna classes miss karna um and you do all the stupid things that you do going through lagging yourself lagging other people um running after points thinking that every time run the will happen you're going to get a girl ah 
none of that happened to me by the way but uh we tried everything that we wanted to try mm-hmm. in those four years um but i think the best part of it is just the ability to have fun lifelong friendships which can't be it what was your first job outside um, iit so i after iit i first went to my phd to ut austin thick direct without any gap no without him ha huh. and i mean during my first real proper do it was a summer internship was at microsoft ha huh. in 93 in the us and was that i started thinking that i know it's a bizarre hmm. or stupid thing in my head but infosys went public in 93 right and somehow i thought if these guys can build a company maybe i can as well and i was very arrogant i thought much is a push out and um i decided to leave my phd uh, and i came back to india thinking that i'll start a company i still didn't quite turn out that way but yes that was the that was the intent so maybe in terms of job though i joined kedis later once the company i was trying to start did not go anywhere the kedis was my first proper job and what was the stint that you were trying to do the startup thing what was the and i'm sure that by the night they they don't call it startup or something no no i mean we actually we to nahi tha india mein it was not something which was popular at that point in time there hmm. were no mentors there was no money hmm. um but there were few people who were entrepreneurs yes. asani but the ecosystem did exist and also entrepreneurship at that point was about building a services company from india so that's what the dominant theme in uh in entrepreneurship at that point. and that's what we were trying to be when did you think you would computer science degree karna and be karna chahiye mb actually was a uh what should i say hitting the escape button for me i said so during my career journey i still had that deep desire to be an entrepreneur and sitting in front of a machine and coding day in day out i thought i'm not learning any skill here i wanted to learn something around business i ended up luckily a friend referred me i ended up in mckinsey ha uh, and by the way that was one of the best business schools i think one can be genuine I did that for a couple of years and that's the period during which I started dating the person ha ah, who became my wife eventually and as we were thinking of getting married even at that point she said that look this life sense is not going to work ha ah, so you have to choose take it either it's making it or it's hmm. and well that turned out to be a simple decision that of course it's her really but what I didn't know is when I leave McKinsey what do I do ah, unlike today where there are thousands of options at that time that was not true so i didn't know what to do so mba was more to figure out what i want to do as opposed to saying i want to do fill a particular skill gap tell us the story of the first in the india office non mba hire what was that so um mckinsey started in 92 in it and they basically said that the safest option for them is to hire iit and i really um and they did that in 92 93 94 95 um there was a wave going on or thinking going on because globally making cr is all kinds of background and they felt that look they need to have diversity hires ha. and what are the diversity definition was to hire non india and a friend of mine a batchmate of mine from it referred me in and um interesting the first guy who interviewed me he had moved from canada uh he might have heard of him from from Achana right right and ramat is the one who interviewed me first and since he was without an mba himself he actually coached me a lot through the interview process as i went through on how how to conduct myself uh to be able to get through and uh that's how it happened. He was also a technical guy deep into robotics yeah doing that's nice the that's right pehli baar unhone non non mba agi no that's a amazing story so but tell us about the computer science of the india mein bhi padhi thi aur bahar bhi padhi thi what was the difference in the teaching pedagogy of computer and what was the difference because us was in cutting edge and india way this wave was started so what was the difference actually honestly i thought at least the computer science curriculum in it in delhi ha huh, was outstanding because most of the teachers were very young it was a very young department 
it started i think only in 84 or 85 something like that so we i don't know i, I forgot but maybe we were fourth batch fifth batch sixth batch whatever it was but we were amongst the early batches of computer science in Delhi. Huh. all the faculty were young very young they were mostly all phds from the us so i thought it was very contemporary and very high quality of instruction Look, as a student, we all like to complain that whatever. And we had our fair share of that too. But as I look back, I think it was just outstanding. In fact, I like my master's or PhD student as well. But in terms of incremental learning of computer science, I would still say that IT still forms the grounding for me, not master's. The one difference, however, is that in an undergrad, you are given problems that you try to solve. PhD is a lot about finding the problem that you want to solve. And that process of finding a problem and the ability to persist for a long time to solve for that problem, that's a very different skill and which clearly I didn't have. But uh, that's actually a different part of it. I guess a PhD. You know that McKinsey was the best business school. Yeah. Tennis, what all McKinsey taught you? Actually, well, Basically, it's a Gadego Gora Banana Katin. That's what McKinsey was, uh, especially for me, ah, because I didn't come from a business background. Um, I remember that I would be sitting in meetings hmm. and all the MBAs will be using terms like NPV and cash flows and this and that. And I'll be literally trying to hide myself or looking at the walls because I didn't know what those meant. Um, but I think it. McKinsey was the place where I think the part of McKinsey that was outstanding was the amount of feedback they give you day in, day out. And I realized that it's not because they don't like you. In fact, they do it because they like you. They want to make you better every single day. And at times it felt overwhelming. But literally every meeting you go to, the debrief sports the meeting in terms of what's the outcome of that, Every analysis you do, yeah. so out of that analysis, yeah. they actually drill very deep. And I mean, when I say McKinsey, it's all consulting firms, today, of course. But for someone like me who was not coming from an MBA background, I thought that was one of the most valuable ways to learn this. What were the projects you were part of at McKinsey? It so happened for me that bulk of what I did also ended up in enterprise software. Now, that was not by design, by plan, but I think my life has been enterprise software one way or the other. There's only one project I did at McKinsey, which was a non-enterprise software, which was uh, being in a steel plant uh, for cost cutting. And I think by far, uh, if I have to pick a period in my life, well, maybe there's one more, but where I think I went through the most intense learning, I think working in that steel plant. I was a kid, huh? 25 years old, 26 years old, something like that. And you're going to these old steel plant of India, you have, you have to cut 25, 30% cost. You have to fire people. Huh? And I think it was just such a different growing up experience for me, dealing with the hostility in the plant. Mm. Um, because many of these things are not about problem solving. Mm. Imagine you're going to a CFO yeah. and telling the CFO that in the next month, 25% of his staff needs to be and you better convince him. And if if it's not convincing, you still make it happen one way or the other. And for someone of my background who didn't deal with that kind of stuff at all, um, it was a fabulous experience. So then you went to in in, in Seattle, so which in 98, 99, I did. In France, I believe. France. Uh, only France. In Seattle didn't exist anywhere else. Okay. Or how was the experience there? The well, NCR was my honeymoon. Hmm. Uh, I had gotten married six months back. Asha, that one year hmm. was a fabulous year. I keep saying for many other places too, but um, NCR was truly um, a one year long party, nothing else. Um, it's a bad, and I went there with that objective huh, that I truly just want to have fun. I also knew by that time because I'd been. At a master's, I'd been uh, an undergrad. I'd worked in between. By that time, I think I also knew that the most fun I'm ever going to have is in school. Mm -hmm. I also knew that there was no other school for me there. True. So in some sense, you knew that, look, 
जो करना है अभी कर लो इसके बाद नहीं मिलना है सो आई ट्रेवल अ लॉट ऑल अक्रॉस फ्रांस है लिटरली एवरी कॉर्नर ऑफ दैट कंट्री पार्टी लाइक दर इज नोट टूमारो है एंड ब्लू अवे मनी है विच आई डोंट रिपेंट इट बट आई टू पे फॉर सेवरल ईयर्स पे बैक फॉर सेवरल ईयर्स बट या it is uh, one of the best places of my life france me how is france culture and how are france people and tell us something about it you know there is a lot of misconception about french people which is that they are rude they are arrogant especially yeah, yeah, yeah. and i think people form an impression of france based on parisians it's like people trying to judge india by delhi mm-hmm. um people trying to judge us by new york which i think is a is an unfair thing to do they right, actually right uh, plus also there are language barriers we like it but at least we are a fabulous time and we even it's one of our favorite places on earth we go back there often um we travel throughout the country like we found them to be exceptionally friendly and also by the way exceptionally smart and the engineering system in france hmm. is actually very high so the french in- engineering talent actually is also very high i remember that time in iid there there were what sort of French institutes you said hamari jab mein tha na uske baad shuru hua i think kareeb 5 6 saal baad shuru hua and there were a lot of exchange students that used to come to france so abhi tak ki journey mein we see kiya you know you studied computer science later days kiya computer science pe uske samne baith ke kuch nahi karna wanted to do something in business but do you think ms and computer science and then computer science or mba ka jo combination tha it helped you in finding the True purpose and key, मुझे एक्चुअली करना है या फिर यूट सजेस्ट की नहीं यार अगर बिजनेस करना है तो इंजीनियरिंग नहीं करनी चाहिए डायरेक्टली आप बिजनेस एजुकेशन करो सी इन ऑल ऑनेस्टी इन टर्म्स ऑफ इंक्रीमेंटल लर्निंग आई डोंट थिंक एम बी गिव मी इट डिट गिव मी एट वेरी डिफरेंट नेटवर्क दर इज नोट हाथ बट आई थिंक इन टर्म्स ऑफ लर्निंग बिजनेस आई प्रॉब्लम लर्न अलॉट मोर इट से um as i said insiad was a one year honeymoon mm. it was a one year party mm. it was a chance for me to think through what do i want to do next in life and uh, but would i have missed a beat in life without going to an mba i don't think so and then after the mba what was your first job well after mba initially i also did an entrepreneurship course there acha and there were four of us who wrote a business plan to start an e-learning company yeah. we pitched to multiple european vcs half nobody gave us a dime but um there was a massive loan on the head uh, after that year so we knew that we can't start without vc money hmm. so anyway the next thing was to basically take up a job i almost joined mckinsey back hmm. but i was very keen to work with startups somehow yeah. and then i came across this consulting firm in the us ha in the bay ha it had existed since the early 70s they only used to focus on building growth strategies or product market strategies for it companies and roughly half their work was the startups which i'm doing make an appeal acha it doesn't exist ha and i thought that look this sounds exciting because in mckinsey i do the same stuff on over again but this firm will allow me to work with startups and maybe if i work with startups i learn how to build a startup and we will be come so that was a motivation in the head and that's what i did so this was his second stint ki mujhe wo karna and before the test is kiya people who go for an mba probably not end up doing their startup in the early days because when i was abhi loan liya hai to pehle loan chukana hai na bilkul so how can someone come out of this catch 22 situation kiya जब तक पैसे नहीं होंगे तब तक बिजनेस नहीं करेंगे तब तक बिजनेस नहीं करेंगे तब तक पैसे नहीं कमाएंगे लुक आई डोंट थिंक दैट सर्टेन लेवल ऑफ फाइनेंशियल स्टेबिलिटी इज एक्चुअली नॉट अ बैड आइडिया टू हैव द फोन यू बिकम एंड वन हार्श लर्निंग इन लाइफ एक्चुअली इज दैट सम बेसिक फाइनेंशियल इंडिपेंडेंस इज एक्चुअली वेरी कट it gives you the independence as we are saying to do other things that you want to want to do but unless you are on that stable platform so i pushed myself to the brink let's say hmm. i think this partly i never cared about money i blew away a lot of money hmm. i don't even know how now as any ke maine koi ferraris wagera khareedi batana na 
but um my wife also did an mba hmm. she did one startup in the us ah. and the firm i was with basically began to go downhill in 2001 2002 when the downturn in tech happened and i think and for a year i didn't get paid says so combination of two loans startup just that karte karte hmm. after 10 years of working i was down to zero dollars this is 2001 this is 2002 2000 and for well, once i mean while i have always followed my heart uh, uh without actually too much thought around it uh that was a bit of a shock to me and i had taken like my father and his brothers had taken out their ppf money to for my mba uh, i actually didn't care much about after working for a few years even post mba in us when i didn't have any dollars and i had to ask my parents for money again after being married for me at least it seemed very humiliating and that's the time i question my last 10 years post it i said what have i done i mean where am i going with this thing and that was a phase of my life where i said that look i just need to first become stick and because i couldn't get a job for a year year and a half and i always wanted to be a product manager hmm. i couldn't get a single job i finally got a job as a sales guy for half the salary that i was making and that time my motto was or mantra was that just make sure that you have some money in the bank to do it to us for it i don't have to ask and this is 2002 it's 2002 end and which company you join i joined civil you would not have heard of it ha ah. civil is the company that created the word crm was a first company in crm used to be a darling of the wall street was one of the hottest companies again enterprise ha yes. ah. ah. my career i make it i was all enterprise of ha ah. so um civil was there but civil was also going down the tube ah. i joined and then i ended up switching to sap and again in sales hmm. and while i never wanted to be in sales hmm. sometimes actually you don't know about things that you would have exposure to and you therefore tend to judge from a distance huh? once i entered sales i realized that this is the animal i love the most i i couldn't imagine that there was a sales guy in me but i just loved it i think the the thrill of a deal um was just unbelievable and then i did sales for 10 years we have heard from your kali at sap that you are a combination of strategic intellect plus people skills tell us what does what do people admire in you what what are can you break people skills for us because you are the parts of that honestly i don't know what it is i'm trying to i don't even know if i'm good at but i'll give you just a contrary example for a minute ha at mckenna ha my first managerial experience ha was to have two mba students in the summer program ha out of berkeley ha um they were both my age will do best well. and you know when you leave the internship hmm. you do these exit interviews with all the interns say like, and they gave the feedback that they will never join mckenna because they were they were so pissed off and um i t- working with people is partly just being aware of who you are hmm. and I don't know how should how should I put it, but your role is to make sure that you are providing the environment for others to give their best. They are not there to do the work that you want to get done. They you need to ask yourself what can I do to make this person successful, and um, that less does take some time to change. Hmm. Uh, but. for me at least my energy comes in working with people and uh sap was very kind to me hmm. and i had a fabulous 9 year and i i don't think i could have written the script any better than so 9 years at sap everything is going good are you in your you know back hiding in audio feet no i but the, it didn't go quite that way huh. what happened was i was there for the first few years in the us ha huh. my father passed away in between my parents were visiting germany hmm. my father had a heart attack so he passed away my mother then moved with me to us hmm. and literally in a few 
months of her moving with me, she got diagnosed with a late stage cancer. And she said that she needs to be back in India for whatever time she has. Mm. And certain lives, certain decisions in life get taken for you when you're not taking them. This was one of those. Huh. So we moved back to India mm. at literally a few weeks notice. And then I switched to SAP India. But I think I was lucky that I had a, I saw a period of tremendous growth for SAP in the US. And then I entered India and sometimes timing is everything and you don't select the, that timing. I think I came at a time when SAP India was just ready to take off. Ah. So there was a five year period where I think one of the most thrilling rides I had was uh, with SAP India. And um, SAP also gave me the chance to do a wide variety of roles. Hmm. I just did so many different roles. Eventually, I ran the p in India as well, which I thought was a fabulous experience. How was that time? What was that time? market was that It was booming. This, was, this is around what, what year? You're well, um, I came in 2007, back 2007. India was the hottest story on earth at that time. Right. And 2008 was a great year. Yeah. And then Lehman Brothers happened. 2009 was a shitty year. Hmm. In India as well, because it is hard. But 2010, 11, 12, again, were great years. Hmm. But I mean, India, Indian economy was actually consistently growing, barring that Lehman Brothers impact. But uh, we, so India was actually one of the best markets. I think we were the fastest growing geography globally for SAP for at least two years out of those five years, and the fastest one in Asia for another two years at least. And you were at the VP position. I was, yeah, I did different roles. Huh. Eventually played the chief operating officer role for three years at SAP India. Were you satiated, KR? This is the CX. No, no, I, uh, but quite the contrary. Huh. Quite the contrary. I mean, look, in the grand scheme of things, huh. India is a very small territory for SAP. In fact, if you look at most MNCs, huh. India is 1-2% to 2 of their territory. Hmm. So you can give yourself any title you want to give in India. But the reality is that you're still a small pawn in the grand. Okay. Huh. I wanted to go up the ladder. Hmm. And I think I had all the opportunity at that point in time. Uh, but as I said, a lot of decisions in life happen when you don't take them. Hmm. So my mother uh, passed away uh -huh. in 2000. SAP was actually keeping me in India because of my family's situation. They started pushing me back to move back to the US. Uh -huh. And by the time my wife, who used to work at Adobe, had started a company. And she said, look, we can't do it. Uh -huh. So now I had to find something for me to do. Okay. And I didn't want to go from an SAP to an Oracle to an IBM to a Cisco or whatever. It's just a, it's the same one to two percent game everywhere, so it doesn't matter. And I was, I took a step back for a year. In a sense, I worked with a coach for a year, where the objective function was to figure out what do I want to do with the next twenty five years. And I, this time, I told myself, unlike the two thousand two period, that now I don't ever want to work for mine. I will do what I truly want to do. Huh. And I also don't want to keep my past as a mechanism to predict what I do in the future. <laughs> I'll take a clean sheet approach. So this coach of mine actually helped me quite a bit in this process. How old were you and who was your coach? So I was 41 years old at that time. Hmm. Um, my coach was actually an ex-entrepreneur. Huh. He had also been in India, had country manager for one other software company in the past as well, was an author. I'd done wide variety of things and an entrepreneur. So I worked with him and actually a lot of other people helped me in that one year. Many brush of founders as well. You can drop in the names and all. So um, I went back to basics to figure out uh, what do I like to do? Hmm. What are my constraints in life? And what kind of professionals will suit the things that I like to do? And I came to the conclusion that the mm -hmm. desire for entrepreneurship that I put at a back burner huh, because I needed to be financially independent, um, that sort of animal sort of came back mm -hmm. to the table again. I also always had a love for computer science. See it. Um, I also came to the conclusion that I'm not an entrepreneur. <laughs> right? I think years of my SAP experience, first of all, Totally spoiled me. And I just think, I think you get used to too many luxuries. Ah. And being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur requires you to be just very competitive. Hmm. 
And I, at least I came to the conclusion that I don't have it in me. But the next best thing is to work with early stage entrepreneurs, build something from the ground up with people. Of course, I'm not the one building, they're the ones building. But to the extent I can be part of those journeys, I wanted to be part of it. And at least that's how the thought of being a VC happened. Hmm. I was fortunate that I got a chance to meet uh, some partners at uh, Ashish, actually. I met Ashish Gupta, uh, who is an outstanding guy, as you know. In the masterclass, you called him a god. Why? <laughs> because we, we have interviewed him. Uh, and he was at the campus few days back. And the level of insights, a golden pot, pure gold. But tell us, how did you meet Ashish, sir? He, you know, Ashish, I have not met hmm. a better combination of IQ and EQ more than what Ashish has. And I, I think to pack that much IQ and that much EQ in a single, single human being is just very hard. And he's the one guy where I think I've been to probably hundreds of meetings with him. Even today, every meeting that you go with him, you learn something. Just every single. He's one of those. And there's something that you have learned, picked from him. I think his ability to be truly first principles thinker and not worry about the patterns from the past is actually truly incredible. And... Um, I also think he's an amazing listener. And he also has that deep empathy for entrepreneurs hmm. that I think very few individuals have. And he was a period in which he was a coach. How did he get him? I was more trying to meet people to understand what investing is. Okay. In fact, I was not immediately sure whether it's early stage, late stage, whatever. Uh -huh. I was meeting all kinds of investors. I was actually thinking of taking a year break at that. Okay. So a friend of mine actually connected me to uh, to Helium. Yes, buddy. And that's how I got connected to Ashish. And one thing led to another. Uh, by I was only figuring out what the industry is. It so turned out they were looking for someone at a partner level to join. Oh. And they made an offer when I was not even thinking about it. But some things happen when you're not thinking about them. It was one of the earliest biggest fund 600 million dollars and you how, how long do you work there i was there only for three years huh. i was only in the third fund got it or but what happened what led you because then we believe he when helion broke one was stellaris how was stellaris born what was inception story so um there were lots of changes in the partnership with helion huh. in the 2014-15 period hmm. And as a result of which, some of the founders had left as well. Huh. And so we were in a bit of a flux during that time. Mm -hmm. uh, different people had different ideas on what we want to build, how we want to build. Take it. And uh, my two partners and I, we were also partners at Hiyad. We had certain ideas. We still felt that we had the energy huh. and that we wanted to pursue those ideas in building a new firm. Huh. And that's how the three of us thought about starting Celeris. And sometimes it's easy to build something from ground up than to change something else. Okay. And that was an effort. And I think partly the reason we started is because we didn't know how hard it was. To start. And I, which is why I often say that to be an entrepreneur, you need to be fresh. If you knew too many things, you will probably not. That's where the story comes, pitching to 1200 LPs or TML. What was the story? Now you learn that after 1200 times and after 1200 times, it's the learning curve. And this is for raising your first fund. Yeah. Hmm. Um, as I, I think, uh, being an entrepreneur, and hmm. I mean, we were not truly entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, hmm. but we were, let's call ourselves fund entrepreneurs. Huh. It is a humbling experience because suddenly you don't have the brands behind you. You are just you at that point. You are asking people to put money behind you at that point. And um, all the arrogance that you have had about your own past and what you have done hmm. actually just comes to the ground at that point. 
and you discover actually a lot. I think um, I will say this pretty shamelessly that a lot of your true friendships uh, you actually realize using these friends. And we were overwhelmed by the fact that and I'll go back to my IT days here in some sense. And most of these guys, as I've said, are Plaksha founders as well. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, maybe I'll just take two, three examples. <laughs> take an Alok Mittal. Ha. Take an Neeraj Agarwal. Take ha. an Ashish Gupta. Ha. Benori. Ha. All these guys. But these had been my closest friends. And they invested in you. They all. I mean, literally, as we were even thinking that we will start, they all said, don't worry, we'll back you. And I know None of them were ever looking for any financial return. In fact, as far as they're concerned, they were giving that money over to charity. Hmm. Um, because they knew that I didn't have any clue of investing either. Uh, Sorry about how at that point in time. Yeah. But they were doing it just to support. And similarly, my my partner's friends as well. And that's how we collected the first ten fifteen million dollars. But the moment you go beyond your immediate circle for circle, it becomes very hard. You are on your I just very you just hear nose and nose and nose and nose. You going so many rejections. I think the beauty of having three partners hmm. is that there are days when you are down, but the others yeah, are pull them. you up. Huh. And there are days when they are down and you pull them up. And I think if I was alone, I would have quit the field. I was able to survive because of my partners. And um they are by the way fabulous investors, both of them. Hmm. And they pulled me through those periods when I was really, really good. And the first time, when your friends had a fund for 10 15 million dollars, how did they invest in it? No, it was part of the bigger fund. Yes, it's a, it just, even the bigger fund you incrementally add, about it. add to the corpus. Thank you, investors. So they, they were the first ones I went to, uh, to, to ask for money. Got it. And uh, for whatever it is worth, I think through my days of selling, hmm. You learn to be patient enough ha, to ask people for money. <laughs> and uh, that's what we did. That's what you have to do. So you see, the entrepreneurship is the hardest way of money. Yeah. But what we have learned from people to get wealthy, you have to be a part of business. Either you do that through stocks or by starting your own business. But you have a very contrarian view upon that. Can you break that down? Yeah, I think it depends on what your definition of wealth is. Hmm. I think if you want to make a good amount of money in life huh, without taking too much risk, I would rather do a job. And please don't underestimate hmm. the amount of money you can make in jobs. Because remember, you're not joining as a bank clerk uh, in a public sector bank here. Hey, that's not the jobs we are talking about. The jobs you will join, you will be joining large multinationals, financial institutions, consulting firms, maybe VC funds, who knows, right? All those kinds of jobs. And most of these jobs are pretty remunerative. And not only are they remunerative, they actually grow pretty rapidly. So please don't, please don't underestimate the amount of money you make in jobs. Uh, to date, at least most of my financial net worth has come from the time I was at SAP. If you have to make an insane amount of money, ah, then I agree, entrepreneurship is the only way. Because there you're playing very high risk and a very high risk. And because it's very high risk, again, by large, the odds are against you. Very few succeed. And uh, behind every success that you read in the newspaper, the hundred dead bodies are not visible to you. So, because those are not the ones that appear in the press. So how has been your journey with Stellaris you're a part, you know? And what all NT portfolios do you have? And tell us about the journey. So Stellaris journey has been great. So, take it. Um, um, it was an experiment. It was a thought. Huh. And I think because I had the fortune of partnering with two people um, whom I could trust more than I could trust myself. Huh. Huh. I think that journey, at least for me again, I realized that the notions of success or failure are actually very flimsy by much. 
And if you're not able to enjoy the path along, it's just very hard to survive. And at least the reason I've been able to survive is because of my parents. Um, and we were lucky that when we started, it was a very down cycle. Huh. Why it was, it hurt us in fundraising, huh. but at the same time, we started investing in a market where correct value. where supply of capital was low, huh. valuations were low. Huh. You could take your time to diligence, and in the first couple of years, and that I would call a lot of luck, and I said, we were able to back some companies that have done exceptionally, like like Mama Art. Um, we took that bet back in 2018. Casey, what is it? Was it an outbound thing? Yeah, fair inbound. No, one of my colleagues uh, specializes in doing consumer investments and brands. Has he had been looking at a lot of companies? He had a very well defined thesis in his head on what internet first brand should be like. Yeah. And he loved the founders, so he was very keen to make that. Who who was he? Uh, my partner, uh -huh. Rao Jones. Okay, got it. And um, um. She did that and we were opposed to it, the other new partners. But in the end, we trusted his gut to make uh, that bet. And the company has been just an absolute rocket ship. Um, one of my other partners uh, banked a company called Propelled in the lending space, huh, in education lending. Um, lending is one of those where you can be very big very quickly, but actually sit on a pile of garbage. Because you can give money to as many people as you want. But whether you, you would ever collect back is not clear. He never would have. But uh, he backed with a very strong thesis in that area and a team that was very thoughtful. And they have done exceptionally well. Other company that has done well is Watchfix, Mr. Kadamia, which uh, Kadim uh, yeah. and Vara, of the two founders, again, very thoughtful, level headed, conservative founders who like to grow a company brick by brick in that sense. But at some point, the power of compounding comes into play. And they have been one of the best SaaS companies from India. But I think as investors, sometimes we give ourselves too much credit for what we knew. The reality is we knew very little at that point. And some of that luck has to sort of accompany you. Right. And at least in our first one, we were quite fortunate. And what was your thesis why you were investing in this what fix? So um, the thesis was the following hmm. that at a very macro level, hmm. the belief was that the amount of software in our lives is just going to continue. Take it. A huh. lot, lot more software will come than we can imagine. And as more and more software comes, it gets more and more difficult for users hmm. to use so many different software. Hmm. Sometimes you actually don't even know for doing X, do I go to this software or that software? Even that is not clear. Right. And so, and people go in and out of jobs all the time. Software is also getting released with different versions every month, every three months, whatever, it just becomes very hard for users as well. So in some ways, Watfix is a software to use other software. I know it's a bit ironical huh. that you need software to use software, huh. but in a nutshell, that's what it is. And when we took the bet, it seemed very non-intuitive huh. and almost to the point of being stupid. The two founders don't come back from very fancy backgrounds. <laughs> um, very down-to-earth guys. Um, not very charming either. So I initially backed them at Helium. At the seed stage. When they were only two founders, they didn't have an employee. And as you we were raising money for Stellaris on the first fund, by the time I worked with them, huh. I was very keen that we back these guys next next round. So we preempted the round and we were fortunate that they knew that we didn't even have a fund by that. Huh. They agreed to sign a term sheet with us even when we didn't have a fund. And they knew this. Huh. They knew this. They knew this. And um, so thanks to them um, who agreed to let us in our new avatar also be part of the company. And uh, it's been a great partnership with them. Project, when you invest with a fund, do you also invest your own money? Yes, you have to, because you want to align the incentives with your LPs. Hmm. Otherwise, you could just be a reckless shooter, because you don't have any skin in the game. So, it's, LPs will force you in the right way that you have to put your own capital. Of course, hmm. I mean, 
when we started, our net worth was very small. So there's only so much capital we could put in. Like we have to put in money in the funds. And so when you invest in software space, so there are multiple companies trying to solve a different, try to solve the same problem. How do you take this approach here? Is so for example, let's say teams we always on kar rahe, notion on kar rahe, and then other things. Then how do you approach ki yeah, is problem ko solve karne ka ye tarika ye company sahi karne I should back this company. Um, your question is a good one to which at least I don't know a perfect answer. The one good thing about at least enterprise software is that it is not a winner take all. Usually in every large market, there are several great companies that you can. Uh, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five, maybe six, depends on what space it is. But multiple companies will get created. And so you do ask yourself the question, first of all, is it a large enough market with massive tailwinds? Because if that's true, then hopefully multiple boards will actually go in the right direction. That's that's one thing. Secondly, when you back an early stage team, you are looking for some unique insight that the founder is bringing to the table. At that, um, you don't know the full path because nobody knows the full path. There are so many more variables that will come in the picture as you sort of start that journey. But you are basically trying to ensure that these founders, hmm. one, do they have a unique insight, and two. Is there some skill that they bring to the table that is so unique that sets them apart from the rest and will allow them to be successful? And this because in this as well, it has to be the technical skills, not necessarily. Huh. I mean, let's take WhatsApp as an example. In fact, you can divide the world of software into two broad categories. You can talk about application software, which is common business users use. It can be a CRM application, HR application, finance application, whatever. Okay. Versus Insta and dev products, where the customer is either a CIO or a developer. The latter category usually is deeper tech. Mm. Their actually tech capabilities need to be far deeper mm. and you will put a lot more emphasis on the tech capabilities of the team. But in the application space, you put a lot more emphasis on product skills, the ability to think through what the product should be and the ability to build a distribution which is go to market is what you actually put a lot more in. What is the biggest mistake that these SaaS entrepreneurs and SaaS companies do, which, you know, is a killer to them? Actually, I think the answer is more generic, not just to SaaS, but to others as well. Huh. Early on, don't think about large TAMs, large markets as your definition. Find a narrow slice where you think you have a right to be. Once you get a chance to plant your feet in a strong way, you will always find ways to build your empire around it. But if you don't plant your feet firmly in one small piece of land, you will actually never be even standing it. Can you give us an example? So, um, let's um, um, let's take let's take what fits itself. Please check it. Right, um, they were initially selling to learning and development folks in companies, sometimes for internal applications, sometimes so they were all over the map initially on the kinds of people that they were selling to large companies, small companies, not clear that. Yeah. And I remember at one point they decided that look, we are just going to go for enterprise applications like Salesforce and others and sit on top of them. And they, in fact, initially began with Salesforce. Mm -hmm. And they said, that will be our focus. Take it. And it took some maneuvering of the ship to go in that direction. But um, that's what allowed them to initially win in that category and then expand. So tell us, you listen to a lot of pitches, thousands of pitches. Kabhi aisa hoi ki kisi startup founder ki jo pitch usne diye, usse si ke you learned and you, you know, induced that learning in your pitch to LPs to raise your fund? Uh, look, uh, first of all, we learn hmm. only through entrepreneurs. Hmm. Most things we learn as VCs. Hmm. Because we don't have anything before. People ask us pitch karte hain, hum unse 50 ke That's how we learn. 
And so in an abstracted form, you're right. What we learn from them and the point of view that we form of the world going forward is coming from those conversations only. And that point of view on the forward-looking world is what we are pitching to our agents. So when that says yes, um, sometimes we give specific examples also. Hmm. So I guess to a large extent what you're saying is true, uh, that we learn from uh, folks. Also, as a firm grows, gradually when you are pitching to LPs, the thing that you're pitching the most is the successful companies in your portfolio. And essentially those are the ideas that are coming from those founders. You are not the, we are not the creator of those ideas. Uh, like we will use a mama art and a word fix and a propel uh, in our LP business. Their success is what allows us to be successful in the first place. Tell us about how AI is impacting the investing space and what's your take on the future with AI? You know, I'm both excited and scared hmm. with AI. Hmm. I long back used to be a small practitioner of it. Huh. Then left the world of programming altogether. But through the last 10 years of investing, I'm trying to rerun a lot of stuff. Um... By and large, the trajectory of AI has been very gradual, very slow. And uh, I would argue that was true even until 12 months back. It was a forgotten uh, child of... Even if not forgotten, I think the pace was slow. Hmm. But what has happened in the last 12 months has been just totally mind blowing Even though, I think three years back, hmm. two years back, two years back, we had come out with a thesis paper saying that the world of enterprise software will be completely changed with the AI. Stellaris, yeah, published that. And we published that together with the World Bank. And we said that this landscape will be reinvented. Mm -hmm. Much like Cloud did, this is the next big. But I'll also confess, I didn't realize that it will happen so quickly. That's the part I didn't know when we did that. If you look at today what has happened, over the last six months, I think AI capabilities have both been deepened and democratized in a way that we could not. And I think the big thing that's happening with AI, um, there's a, in fact, the guy who I think is also by the reflection, hmm. Aman Singla. Ha. Huh. I think of Aman as one of the smartest guys I know. Iman Sarai. Huh? Iman Sarai. Iman Sarai. Yeah. Uh, super smart. Um, I was meeting Aman a month back mm -hmm. in the US and he was saying that, look, there are two ways to think about AI. One is to say that, let's say there are 20 million programmers in the world. It's going to take many of those jobs. The other way to think about AI is you have only 20 million programmers today. There'll be a billion programmers tomorrow because there's AI. Right? And he said that that's the way he thinks about it, which is that the pie is expanding massively because of it. And I think just the notion of, see, you can give logical instructions in plain English to someone. You may not know how to write the code, right. but that logic still sits in your head. Do this, and if this happens, then do this, and if this not then do this. In plain English, you understand that logic. Right. It's just that technology was too hard to make it happen. But that's what is being enabled. So are you seeing this wave? So some people are saying that it's a metaverse wave. It's going to be Some people are saying that it's going to be quiet. It's going to be quiet with AI. But some people are very concerned that no, development should be quiet. It should be quiet. So are you seeing the influx in the pitches of... Yeah, I can't say that with 100% confidence. Ha. Because we have all been wrong many times now. Right. But... Hmm. I'd be very surprised if this wave is not a world redefining wave. And it's not being led by one entity or whatever. I just think so many things have come together. Um, in some sense, the moment has arrived uh, for AI to be truly mainstream. Uh, but I think what is also different is the, the depth, the power at which things that AI can do today, as I said, we could not have and no matter which application you think about, hmm. it can be remade. Most things can be remade. 
with the power of AI. Yeah, and they are being, and a lot of things are just, frankly, limited by our own imagination. And that's why I believe that the landscape will be completely different. There'll be some existing players who will reinvent themselves, retool themselves. In fact, very encouraging to see what a Microsoft is doing or an Adobe is doing. But I think lots of new companies will get created in the And are there companies in the Stellaris portfolio who are you know, leveraging the power of AI and you are excited about? Yeah, we just did a seminar, internal workshop, huh, where we asked our own portfolio companies to share what they're doing with Gen AI. And eight of them shared. A company called Combi. Hmm. And they are generating production quality front-end code from design files like Figma which probably would feel like science fiction some years back. And I see their demo and I can't believe that production level code through Figma files. From Figma files, wow. just through machine. And um, it is scary. That's why I'm saying it's a scary thought also uh, at many levels. But um, see what technology can do. How was your recent trip to Israel? So, you know, Israel is a bit of an awakening moment. I'd always heard so much about Israel. Huh. I'd never been there. And I don't know, I think I was clearly stupid, but I thought Israel is fifteen to $20,000 GDP per capita or whatever. Nine, ten million. First thing I learned is Israel is actually $52,000 cap GDP per capita. It's actually richer than most European countries. Or probably the richest compared to any European country. Number one. Number two, it's a tiny country, nine million people. But what amazes me is the hunger and the intensity and the intellect. I don't think there is another country on earth hmm. which combines intellectual horsepower and hunger in proportions that exist in Israel. What's happening there? What's the, you know, in many countries where people, countries have become richer, I think they've lost the hunger. And particularly Western Europe, more so than other places. But well, Israel itself seems they're in day zero. I mean, they they operate with a sense of paranoia on one hand, but also with a lot of pride in their own capabilities to conquer. Uh, and both of which just drive them to do things which are fascinating. And what's the core of these two things? What's the core of their hunger? And I think it's survival instincts. Remember that when Israel became Israel, um, it was surrounded by a massive amount of hostility all around that way. And just survival teaches you a lot of things. Um, and which is the reason they have built their defense the way they have, the way they have built intelligence that they have. And uh, it's also a country which is primarily desert. They had to make, I actually didn't realize the kind of innovations they've done in agriculture and in irrigation, for example. Uh, we only think of cybersecurity uh, in Israel, but actually they've done a lot of different things in technology. But to survive in hostility with nobody to support you um, has either you die, uh, like they say that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. In their case, they didn't get killed, it just made them stronger. And do you think this trend of serving in military has heavily them to shape this innovation culture and how has that thing helped in the in shaping of the Israeli ecosystem? I don't know enough, hmm. but all my friends, uh, Israeli friends have been in the military. And I think they're military, but again, I meet a very subset or skewed subset of those people. Huh. Most of whom actually went to the military in their intelligence unit, etc. Huh. These were the smartest kids uh, in high school and which is why they, they went into those. Many of those have become entrepreneurs or investors in some cases, etc. That's the sort of group I get to see. But many actually were on the battlefield as well. And it teaches you a certain level of team skills, leadership skills, and the survival skills, survival skills that you actually don't get to learn anywhere else. What will it take for India to be at that level, sir? How, because we are so far. Look, I'm very optimistic about India. Otherwise, I won't do what I do. I, um, if so, there is a period post-independence where we were at very low GDP growth for many, many decades. Somewhere, I would say at least beginning the early 2000s, 
I guess since you guys were born or they are about or before that, I think our GDP growth has actually picked up a notch. I think we have a momentum. Like they say, momentum is mass times velocity. Right. We have a mass of a billion point four people of a three trillion economy, which is moving at a pace faster than pretty much every other economy. major economy on earth. True. So that momentum, by definition, is so strong. And I also think that there's a newfound belief in India that didn't exist. We always used to believe we can't do things. But today there is that belief that we can do this thing. Even, even at Plaksha, I mean, as I met all of you, everybody wants to start a company. Everybody wants to conquer the world. And that self-belief that we see today, I think is just a very encouraging sound. What are you bullish on? Like? So my primary theme of investing is AI hmm. and its impact on enterprise software. So at least bulk of my time I spent on that. Uh, but different people in our team actually look at different stuff. Um, I think the good thing about India is that no matter which direction you look at, there is an opportunity. Is there opportunity in education in India? I mean, do we have enough schools, enough colleges? No. Uh, is there a way to rethink education through technology? Yes. I think there is. What about healthcare? What about financial services? What about transportation? Actually, no matter which direction you look, at least we believe there's a massive opportunity to make a change through technology. And some of that will be done by the government, but a lot of that will actually happen in the private sector. So that's why we are very bullish on the kinds of opportunities that will exist in this country. Super excited. So thanks a lot for sharing your wonderful insight. Best wishes for Stellaris. I hope that there will be founders from Plaksha which will become a part of your journey and you will become a part of their journey. What would be your last set of advice for the people who want to do big, the, the future entrepreneurs, and they are in college right now? Make a lot of friends hmm. here. Uh, do a variety of things. Um, try and building some stuff as well. Uh, be part of team activities. Um, and as you get closer to your graduation, don't act from a point of fear. Um, because that actually leads you to sometimes way too much caution. Um, enter the world from a point of confidence. Be prepared to make mistakes and be prepared to fail. I mean, clearly you guys have it in you that you will get up again and you will again do something and you will be successful. So, don't be too harsh on yourself when things don't go right. Continue to believe in yourself. I think that's important. Thanks a lot. So super amazing.